in AI, there are two very different models out there in the United States and China. How they play together uh, is something that is underappreciated as a challenge. Kaifu is truly the expert on the issue. Let me start by asking you maybe one of the most provocative parts of your book that I think a lot of people here might not get,、um, which is that you don't think AI is very hard. Uh, yeah, actually, when we think about AI, we think of all these fancy breakthroughs. There actually has been just one fundamental AI breakthrough called deep learning. And、uh, described in one sentence, it is take one single given domain, collect a huge amount of data, and get a few AI engineers, data scientists to train a model that can make decisions better than humans. That's all there is, and that the ease of doing that has come down dramatically over the last two years. So、uh, yes, there can be another breakthrough, but、um, uh, but if you look at the last、um, uh, 62 years of AI development, there has been only one such breakthrough, no other. So we can project another, but、um, I would、uh, say the odds are against that. And there are two countries that are good at it. Yes, U.S. is obviously way ahead in research and technology. Um, however, much of what all of what has been invented in AI is in the public domain, open, even open source, open data. So a lot of co-、uh, companies can implement, and then China is actually better at implementing faster. The Chinese entrepreneurs work 100 hours a week, and、uh, there's more data in China, and the government policies support、um, build infrastructure. So actually, just in the last two to three years,、uh, the Chinese、uh, unicorns have. Increased from zero to 15. That is billion-dollar companies, and we've been、uh, fortunate to have been investors in five of the 15 Chinese pure AI unicorns. So, if you're projecting the next, let's say, five, ten years, and you look at this trajectory,、um, the Chinese and the Americans, who do you expect will end up with a decisive advantage, or can you make that? Well,、uh, one thing that's for sure is they're just like in Olympics. There are only three medals. <laughs> Number four doesn't count. In、uh, AI, there will only be two medals, and U.S. and China will both be winners.、Um, it's unclear which one will come out ahead. China is better at implementation, so in lower barrier AI applications like、uh, banking, finance, retail,、um, insurance, manufacturing,、uh, China will probably be ahead. Um, in things like that require a lot of、um, data warehousing, U.S. companies are better at that. And then things that are more complex, like autonomous vehicles, flying cars, U.S. will be better at that. So I, I think we could call it、um, a 50-50、uh, in, in、uh, implementation, monetization, and、um, success. Now, 50-50 wouldn't necessarily sound so bad if it were talking about global trade, where the system was actually quite interlinked, and we really need each other. 50/50 in AI, where the Chinese are investing in potentially a different architecture, different systems, different data, potentially more problematic. Well, today we are in two parallel universes, so there is no AI war from a commercial productization sense.、Uh, we Chinese VCs invest in Chinese companies who build products for Chinese companies and users, and their success will never come at the expense of an American company, and vice versa. This is not necessarily a great thing, but this is the path we're on, especially given the trade dispute. And do you think the Chinese government, in deciding that AI is sort of one of the key strategic、uh, investments they need to make as an industry, makes it more likely that we end up in a Cold War environment between the two countries? Well, I hate to. I hate the term "cold war,"、um, but since Hank brought it up this morning, well, it is a confrontational situation that, in my opinion, doesn't have to be. If I were a world citizen, which I am, I would love to invest in a company where the CTO and research are all American, top MIT, CMU, Stanford grads, and then the CEO and the first market tackled is China with a tenacious、uh, 100-hour work 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 week、uh, CEO. I think that will. Make us the most money, and why couldn't U.S. and China both invest in the company? Why couldn't both countries have the IP? This is just commercial. This is not definitely not Cold War. But again, it doesn't look like we're on the path to、uh, be able to do that dream team investment. If you think about the importance that the Chinese have decided that AI companies will have for them as a government strategically, and the fact that in the United States these companies are very libertarian. Very resistant in many cases to work with the government. Do you think that needs to change in the United States, or do you think it will change in the United States? I think that's the nature of success. I think Silicon Valley is successful because it has that individualistic, free spirit. So I think Google will always be Google,、um, but that has certain advantages. It attracts brilliant people. 
Google has more AI talent than probably all the other AI giants added up together. So it attracts great people. They're more likely to get ahead. It is an American company after all, but they will probably uh, not consider themselves to be subject to, uh, you know, helping, let's say, U.S. government on certain uh, initiatives. But when you say that AI is increasingly simpler than people think and it's about applying massive amount of resources to this data and then building the infrastructure, that to me sounds less like Silicon Valley. It sounds more like the Manhattan Project, which wasn't driven by the private sector. It was driven by the government. And I'm wondering if for this way of thinking of AI, as opposed to many other parts of technology, if that might be the way that you think we're going to end up going. I do think that's what gives China an advantage, is that the sing single-minded moving forward quickly with a large amount of data, and then with government building infrastructure, right? Government in China is building a new city the size of Chicago with autonomous driving, with two-layer downtown, top layer for pedestrians, bottom layer for cars, minimizes the likelihood of what we saw in Phoenix with uh, Uber autonomous driving. Uh, and the Chinese government is building new highways and uh, certain cities like Nanjing is turning into an AI town. I think that kind of government support plus the uh, popularization of the use of AI will give China a much better chance of um, success. That's why it made so much progress in the last three years, and I would expect the progress to continue for the next uh, five years. Now, reading your book, uh, thinking about AI and what it can do, the displacement of jobs is something you're very concerned about. And indeed, it, from your book, it sounds like the fourth industrial revolution can be thought of by many as more of a post-industrial revolution. Who's particularly vulnerable and when? Well, this is an issue for all of us, and the main reason I wrote the book, it wasn't about the U.S.-China competition. It was more about Think about it, if deep learning AI is about one single domain, huge amount of data, superhuman performance, that means the routine white collar and, bl and uh, blue collar jobs are the ones that will be replaced first. And uh, those are the groups of people who will have the hardest time uh, regaining new skills to, for a job. Um, and also many jobs that they might have retrained for will also be displaced by AI. So this presents a major, major problem for the, um, actually these would be the uh, lowest educated, lowest income segments that are doing routine jobs. And then another note is the white collar jobs are going before the blue collar jobs. Because think about a smart loan officer, um, apply, uh, an AI application would displace all, all loan officers instantly. And yet in a complex factory making iPhones, the dexterity and the um, variable environment actually makes the robotics quite hard. It might take another 10 or 15 years to overcome that. How aware is the Chinese government of the levels of displacement that you're talking about, and what are they doing to prepare themselves to be resilient? I think similar to the U.S. government. Uh, not much is yet being done because we're not seeing the uh, governments react to unemployment numbers. So this is still a projection, I think a very logical, inevitable projection, but uh, it's not yet substantiated in real employment. If, if you were to say today to the you said there are two medals, but there are a lot of countries out there that are talking about a third way. We certainly hear that from the Europeans, for example. What would you say to them that they need to do, either to, to have another medal or to recognize it's never going to come and so they need to adapt? Well, I think there is a chance, but I think what's missing in, uh, let's say, most other countries is a very strong venture capital entrepreneur ecosystem and the capital injected. So it's the money and the smart money, and it's the entrepreneurs who are experienced serial entrepreneurs who have the ambition to build things that change the world. Uh, U.S. has that. China has that. There are other countries that may have a chance, Singapore, Israel. Um, and then there are some countries with strong AI, like Canada, U.K., France. So I think these countries do have a chance, but it will still be not at a metal level. And we heard again what Hank said this morning, deeply concerning that the path we're on presently, if not responded to, is going to get us to a world we don't want. What's the one thing in your field of AI that if we come back here next year, go to Beijing, you'd say we're on a better trajectory? What's the one thing that could move us in a positive direction that you think is feasible? Uh, well, I think the academic community continuing to work together as they always have. And I think finding a way that international investments can be made so the know-how in China can be shared with the world um, as well as the capital and investments. As Silicon Valley has done, the, the spirit of Silicon Valley now pervades the world. China has come up with a parallel way of building great companies. And we'd very much like to share that and have a chance to invest in the rest of the world 
if uh, the conditions allow. So we need to bring the people together. We'll still do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Kai Fu League, everyone. Applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Great.